tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It's been a, a lot more organized than I expected. First day, BC students head back to their classrooms also. Today, uh, we have a, a new record high number of cases. 139 COVID-19 cases continue to surge in BC and... There's loopers on me. Yeah. <laughs> Moth invasion. What they're chowing down on and how long they'll be around. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Well, today was the big day. Nervous students and, in many cases, even more nervous parents sending their kids back to school full, full time. After weeks of criticism from teachers and parents, it was finally time to head back to class. Our Susanna De Silva has more on how students, parents and teachers fared on day one. So this is a little bit big here. Yeah. Seven-year-old Raphael is starting grade two and his mom worries that the rules in the classroom are different than what he's learned at home. And even now when we go shopping and groceries, I'm like, don't touch, keep two meters away, keep two meters. And now I, I'm basically saying, well, if the teacher says so, then you can go. But in schools, physical distancing within cohorts isn't required and masks are only mandatory for middle and high schoolers in common areas. In Rafael school district, close to 90% of students have opted to be in the classroom, while Surrey, the province's largest, is still trying to figure out how many kids will return. Unfortunately, you know, the standards that we really need, like smaller class sizes to the tune of, of even 15 or, you know, 22, uh, we're not seeing that. Teacher um, Annie Ohana will have at least 28 kids in her class, and that's not her only concern. And if something goes wrong, then we're going to feel responsible for that. But even as BC reports its highest ever daily caseload, Dr. Bonnie Henry still feels confident schools can reopen safely. We know that we'll have um, cases that, that pop up, and we've seen that in other provinces where school has started as well. If there's no transmission event in the school or there's no exposure when somebody is infectious in the school, then that is not considered an outbreak. And for some families, there was relief today. It was very, very great, and I colored. I thought it, would, it was going to be a lot more chaotic, given how um, unsure and uncertain we were uh, this past few weeks. But it's been a, a lot more organized than I expected. But she knows her comfort level with the back-to-school plan could change again. Bye. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. And with the new school year back in swing, police are reminding drivers to slow down. We know the start of the school year is looking quite different this year than years past. Despite this, drivers still need to slow down, stay focused on the roads as kids make their way to and from school either on bike or on foot. They're reminding us to look out for kids near and around crosswalks and intersections. Of course, never pass a stop school bus when the lights are flashing. And leave more time to get to where you have to go. Keep an eye on the 30 kilometer an hour speed limit in school zones, or you'll face a fine of $196. Vancouver has more than 89 elementary schools and more than 60,000 kids heading back to school. ICBC stats show 61 kids walking or biking are involved in crashes every year. Well, today's COVID-19 numbers are unlikely to put anyone at ease, particularly parents sending their kids back to school. The province has set a new record high for cases in a single day, with 139 cases. Active cases are also at a peak, with 1,412. There are no new deaths, however, so BC's total remains at 213. Of concern is another increase in hospitalizations, up to 42. That's the most since May 21st. 14 of those people are in ICU. The province is currently monitoring just over 3,100 people who may have been exposed to the virus. And these alarming numbers come with new pleas tonight from health officials to keep our bubbles small. And Tina Lovegreen joins us now in studio. So Tina, what are we hearing from them today? Well, health officials admit that, yes, we're all so tired of COVID-19. We're all tired of dealing with these rules and having to say no to celebrations and to events, but that we must keep going because there is a long way to go. And so a new slogan has emerged that officials are hoping will stick with people. 
Dr. Henry has asked us uh, this week to examine our social actions, that we remember to stick to six. Six to t stick to six if you're going out to a, a restaurant or a bar to make sure your group is no larger than six. six. Remember to choose from the same group of people, the same six people, not multiple groups. Stick to six when your plans with others outside your host household have a contact keeper so we can assist you and find people if you are exposed to COVID-19. Stick to six. Yes, that's hard to say, especially if you try and saying it six times fast, but you get the idea. Keep your circle small, especially as we head into the flu season and back to school. And speaking of back to school, Dr. Bonnie Henry also spoke about how parents will be notified of a potential exposure at schools, and it all depends on a number of things. If there is a possible exposure, it may be that some of the learning group may have to be uh, uh, quarantine for a period of time depending on what type of exposure happened, how many people had close contact and that will be part of the investigation that each um, health authority will do with the school. And as for whether we could see a full system shut down as we did back in March, not likely but what we could see is a scenario where a school closes because too many staff members have been exposed and there just aren't enough staff to teach. Mike, Leanne? All right, thanks for that, Tina. A good reminder for all of us to stick to six. After 112 years, community newspaper The Vancouver Courier is closing up shop for good. Back in April, Glacier Media had halted production of The Courier and laid off staff. At the time, management said it was temporary, citing revenue losses and poor cash flow amid COVID-19. Founded in 1908, it was known as the independent Eburn News. The Courier was at one point Canada's largest community newspaper with a weekly distribution of 265,000 copies. And the COVID-19 pandemic is pushing BC's projected budget deficit to $12.8 billion. The first quarter financial report for the fiscal year shows lower than expected revenue and higher spending because of the pandemic. There is some good news, stronger than expected consumer spending, housing activity and employment gains. But Finance Minister Carol James says those have been offset by increased prudence built into the budget due to, quote, to help the B.C. weather the long year. road ahead. James says B.C. is in a good position to do that because of strong finances pre-pandemic. In a landmark ruling today, a private Vancouver clinic has lost a constitutional challenge of B.C.'s public health care rules. A Supreme Court judge dismissed claims that long wait times violated patients' charter rights. And as John Hernandez reports, the decision has big implications for health care nationwide. The case was filed 10 years ago. Dr. Brian Day, CEO of this private surgery clinic, argued that provisions in BC's Medicare Act were unconstitutional, specifically laws against billing and prohibitions on private insurance. Now, Day argued that long wait times for surgeries are a violation of charter rights and that patients should have the option to pay for treatment options. Now, after four years in the courts, a Supreme Court judge released the decision today. He dismissed the challenge, saying medical services are based on need and equal access, not on the ability to pay. Hey, now the decision marked a big win for the province and advocates for public health care. Had the decision gone the other way, critics say it would have opened the floodgates for private health care across the country. The ruling emphasized the strength and the importance of public health care, which is a cornerstone of our identity in British Columbia, a cornerstone of all our identity in all of Canada. So many vulnerable people rely on easy access to health care and, um, and so many people wouldn't qualify for private insurance because of pre-existing conditions. If we had gone the way of the plaintiffs, wait times would have gotten worse, not better. Interesting to know the Supreme Court judge did say there is an issue with wait times in British Columbia and organizations like the Canadian Medical Association say this decision marks a time for us to reflect on how to better improve those wait times. Now Dr. Day did not speak with CBC News today but in the past he did say an appeal would be imminent if the decision went against him. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. A Surrey driver has been sentenced to just under two years in jail after he hit and killed a woman in Maple Ridge two years ago and took off. In April 2018, 31-year-old mother Tassus Vix was struck on Lowheed Highway. The driver sped away and Vix later died. In July 2019, 
Michael Howard Thomas was charged. The Crown says he pleaded guilty to dangerous driving causing death and failing to stay at the scene of an accident. Today, he was sentenced to two years less a day in jail and three years probation. Thomas is also banned from driving for five years. A Vancouver Island man says his dad's truck with U.S. plates from Texas has been vandalized with graffiti. The truck was spray painted with words like pro-Trump. The windshield was smashed and the license plate stolen. According to Jonathan Vidalin, who posted it on Twitter, Vidalin says his dad, who is a Canadian, has been here for almost three months celebrating his first grandchild. He adds that his dad wouldn't even be able to vote for or against Trump given his Canadian citizenship. The incident has been reported to police. Fire crews on Vancouver Island are busy fighting an out-of-control fire in a steel recycling yard just south of Nanaimo, and officials say evacuations are imminent to the immediate area. The North Oyster Volunteer Fire Department was called to Snitzer C Steel Canada just after 9 this morning after receiving reports of a yard fire. The Cowichan Valley Regional District says more than 70 firefighters are currently on scene. It says the fire is being fueled by contaminated material, including a large pile of tires. The BC Wildfire Service is also involved as the fire has spread to trees and brush nearby. Water contamination and air quality are also concerns right now. An emergency operations center has been activated to coordinate a response. And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. So, Joe, you have been watching these tinder dry conditions out there and real rise in wildfire risk. That's right. We are seeing a high to extreme risk across most of southern British Columbia. That's really uh, why fires that started today uh, have uh, spread very quickly. Six new fires across British Columbia in the past uh, 48 hours. Let me take you to our fire danger rating and you can really see the pockets, including the extreme risk in southern Vancouver Island, where we are seeing those two new fire starts. A couple of new fires also uh, in the Kootenai Fire District and parts of of the Okanagan. Small enough that crews are getting a handle on them, but again, uh, six new fires because of these tinder dry uh, conditions. We have still, uh, we still have the special weather statement in place for much of British Columbia, but it has just ended for northern coastal sections. We're also still looking at poor air quality, and I do want to talk more about that in a quick moment. But the reason we're seeing the special weather statement end in through the north is that ridge is flattening. This is the high pressure system that has brought us so much heat, and today, really was the peak of it. Take a look at these records broken. Just a selection. Uh, the official numbers will come out tomorrow, but I would say we've had at least a dozen temperature records fall today. West Van, second day in a row for you. Victoria, both the University and downtown, Squamish, Pitt Meadows, and uh, Malahat all getting uh, a good 10 degrees above seasonal. Uh, we're going to continue to see those warm temperatures over the next uh, couple of days, but they will come down a little bit across the south coast. And watch as they take you through to Saturday, seeing temperatures come down even more as we start to get a westerly flow and that ridge flattens a bit. But because of that wind shift tomorrow, that's our best chance of seeing that plume of smoke from the uh, eastern Washington fires move back into the south coast. So that flattening ridge is something I'm watching very carefully. I know we've got by with poor air quality and haze in the distance, but it's been a couple of days since the uh, orange skyline. That may be a story again tomorrow. So heads up, could be a very smoky Friday. Uh, seasonal temperatures by the time we hit the weekend, and I've got some more clouds in the forecast, but I'll be back to uh, talk more about fires coming up. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Joe. We'll look forward to that because those fires are continuing to rage along the U.S. West Coast. Why thousands are fleeing and the worries that this isn't going to get any better. That's next. And thanks for staying with us tonight during our commercial free live stream. Well, as we know, BC students went back to school today, but in some other countries, kids have been back in the classroom for months. Denmark, in particular, has been held up as an example of how to reopen schools safely. So the CBC's Renee Filipponi visited one school in Copenhagen to see what lessons Canada can learn. 
It's lunch at an elementary school just outside central Copenhagen. And this really looks like sort of a pre-COVID school day. And, and that's the point. Schools in Denmark are on the second phase of their reopening plan. And there are limited restrictions now. Class sizes are back to normal, but hand hygiene remains paramount. The headmaster says it's really a challenge. We've seen that uh, many of our pupils are not aware enough and they don't use the sanitizer, so we have to have one standing in, in the entrance reminding them. And that's what we will do for a period, and then I think they will be aware of it again. Now, Denmark was one of the first countries to reopen schools right across Europe. It was a gradual process that started back in April when the COVID rate was on a steady decline. And unlike many other countries, schools were a priority for reopening and were in phase one before shops and, and restaurants. Now, at the time, rules were much stricter with staggered class schedules, many classes being taught outside, and the kids had to wash their hands every 90 minutes. Now, the teachers' union says that the reopening worked because of good cooperation with the government, who listened to and addressed their concerns, including letting staff with underlying conditions continue to work from home. We have seen that cooperation on all levels have made uh, people feel safe. Dorta Langa says the teacher's confidence in going back helped quell the nerves parents had who, who were concerned in the beginning that their children were being used as guinea pigs. We're in this crisis together. We want to make the best of this. We want education to be as good as possible in these circumstances. And what can we do to make everyone feel safe in that? Now there has been an increase in COVID cases in recent weeks across Denmark with some of the highest numbers they've seen since April. Since the reopening, there have been outbreaks in schools that have led to classes under quarantine and some schools have shut down, but the problem hasn't been widespread. Authorities around the world, including Canada, have turned to Denmark for advice. And officials here have been happy to share lessons learned. But they also highlight that comparing situations in different countries is, is difficult because Denmark has a relatively small and spread out population compared to Canada. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Copenhagen. Yeah, as Renee said, I mean, the, the Denmark uh, clearly was expecting there to be some cases in schools, but they're just, uh, they're trying to manage it, manage it and so far, uh, so good. Yeah, and I mean, here in BC, I know our health officials are also expecting to see some cases, but hopefully also manageable, and maybe we can take some of those lessons from Denmark over here. Okay. Day okay. two, day two of back to school tomorrow. That's right, okay. We'll be back in a few moments. Uh, more local news just ahead. Stay with us. The world is not back to normal. Life has not fully resumed. We are not at the finish line yet. We know we can do it. As phase three of the economic New restart, COVID restrictions life. will mean that elementary... In times like these, get trusted news from a trusted source, your public broadcaster. Anytime, anywhere, anyway. CBC and people. Wildfires continue to devastate our neighbors to the south. The fire situation across all three western states continue to worsen, with at least 12 deaths being blamed on the fires in California. At least a dozen people are missing. The fires have prompted more than 20,000 people to flee from their homes in California alone. Officials say nearly 4,000 structures have burned so far in that state. And let's bring back in meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff. You've been uh, following this for the last uh, several days, Joe, and it, it seems to be uh, continually evol evolving. That's right, and I want to take you to California, where we saw the most rapidly changing situation over the past 24 hours. Take a look at these pictures. This is from the Bear Fire. It has just exploded in size over the past 24 hours. In fact, 
uh, pushing at about a rate of 1,000 acres per 30 minutes, racing through communities in the mountains, pushing very close to Paradise that lost homes back in 2018 and destroying homes in Oroville. Uh, this is the fire that has about 14,000 fire crews uh, splitting their time with along with 29 other major fires uh, in the state. Almost 3 million acres across California burnt to this point, the most ever recorded. I want to take you back, though, to pictures out of Oregon. This is the story we were covering yesterday as fires partially destroyed five different communities. Uh, today, officials really got a chance to assess that damage for the first time talking to evacuees and people that had to escape and flee their homes in the middle of the night uh, amid flames. Uh, take a listen to one survivor leaving Vidak, Oregon. I haven't gone through things like this, and it's been really good. <laughs> it's been good. Yeah, but uh, everybody's just just sticking together and being being happy. It's really overwhelming, it really is. And I've got everything I need. My neighbors do. My neighbors are right over there. They lost everything, but we're good. And the Washington fires also continue to burn, watching winds to pick up again tonight with red flag warnings in place. And Joe, we've seen some of the photos and images um, out of those regions, just air quality, very poor, orange skies everywhere. What's it like down there right now with that? Uh, just wild with those apocalyptic views. Uh, take a look at the pictures over the past 24 hours. Uh, the skies are still orange across many communities, but today it's more of a white zero visibility situation. And that's because yesterday uh, the flames were right up into the upper levels of the atmosphere. Today they're lower levels, so air quality is actually poor. The good news is that with light winds, firefighters uh, will have an upper hand finally, but it also means that, that air quality not improving anytime soon. All right, thanks for uh, that report, Johanna Wagstaff, our senior meteorologist. On to a startling admission from Canada's top soldier. He says far-right activity is a problem across the Army. CBC's Murray Brewster had reported on reservists with links to extreme groups. Now he has this exclusive interview. Stand by. Canadian Rangers on the rifle range. Part-time soldiers with lives and opinions that are not always subject to military discipline. We have a problem with, uh, with far-right activity um, across the Army. If we have one case, that is one case too many. A CBC News investigation recently revealed Canadian Rangers with links to two far-right groups, including one reservist, Eric Meigland, who called the Prime Minister a treasonous bastard online. And we've got to do everything we can to... Uh, to stop this toxicity from seeping into our ranks. So stop it by screening out before individuals uh, who hold these types of belief com beliefs come in and crush it when we find it. But the Army is struggling to do just that. Miglin was ordered released from the Army over a year ago, but he's still serving and likely won't be removed until later this fall. The reason why is now the subject of an Army investigation. He has not been disciplined. A reservist on part-time service is not subject to the Code of Service Discipline uh, while not on duty. Not everyone buys that. Do they have the mechanism? And I suggest that yes, they do. The National Defense Act, specifically Section 129, allows the Army to prosecute offenses that prejudice good order and discipline. But it would need to build a case in order to prosecute. Activists say the Army has to do a better job of monitoring soldiers on and off the job. Commanding officers need to occasionally be looking at the social media profiles uh, of the individuals you know, that, uh, that are under their command uh, and recognize the signs you know, when they're talking about hateful ideologies to, uh, to flag things for, for investigation. CBC News has repeatedly asked Eric Miglin for comment. He's not responded. The investigation into Miglin and his Ranger unit is expected to wrap up this fall. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. They won't eat your sweaters, but they are taking a big bite out of our forests. Just ahead, why we're seeing a massive moth invasion in Metro Vancouver.
Since September 11th, transportation officials have tried to make the skies safer. In Canada, that means air marshals on some flights and a passenger tax to pay for new security measures. But despite these changes, the system still has some big holes. Terry Malewski explains. It's on. So as soon as you see that it's functional. One year on, every traveler knows that security is much tighter. But there are some things they don't know. Okay, and did you pack these bags yourself? Yes, I did. Are you? For example, travelers often assume that their checked baggage is screened in the same way as their carry-ons. But it's not. After I check my bag, is it screened? I can't comment about individual bags. We, uh, we screen as directed by the federal government. Certainly within the next uh, three or four years, a uh, billion dollars is being spent at airports across the country to screen every bag. I'm not going to tell you. For security reasons, it's quite obvious. From the minister on down, no one likes to talk about it, but the fact is that the best screening equipment is just not available off the shelf. So checked baggage is still not screened the way people expect. We have testimony from baggage handlers at Pearson Airport that tell us they don't screen any of the bags with the exception of those going to Reagan uh, Airport in Washington. And what about those baggage handlers and mechanics and cleaning crews? It turns out that they don't get searched the way passengers do when they go to work. We have testimony from police at airports saying that Hells Angels and organized crime are active airside. And we're not searching these people? This is, this is nonsense. And that is something that we're looking at right now. The minister says that's under review, but it could get expensive. There is the alternative of having all airside workers uh, screened, very expensive proposition, every time they go in and out of a secure area. Uh, don't forget, these are people all with security checks. They've all been checked by the RCMP and CSIS. Now, the government is considering whether to order that airport workers be searched, but it points out that there is a lot more surveillance now, and there are sniffer dogs, and there are bags being taken off the aircraft if the owner doesn't board. In short, there is a lot more security. But airtight, that, it seems, is not going to happen anytime soon. Terry Malewski, CBC News, Vancouver. I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Leanne Young for Vancouver Magazine's Restaurant Awards. Toast the city's top restaurants virtually this year on Zoom and Facebook. Register at vanmag.com. And don't miss Surrey Fusion Festival on September 26. Celebrate food, music and culture virtually with cooking demos, dance lessons and more. Visit surreyfusionfestival.ca for the full lineup and check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. Okay, if you've been uh, out at night recently, you've likely seen them. They're even around during the day. That's right. For weeks now, swarms of moths have been fluttering around. Parts of B.C. are in the grips of a voracious looper moth outbreak. And as Belle Puri of CBC's Impact Team reports, areas around Metro Vancouver watersheds are getting the brunt of it. The western hemlock looper moth may be related to butterflies, but don't let its beauty fool you. So we're seeing some significant reddening uh, as the trees are defoliated. Red is a sign the trees are dying, and the looper moth is the reason why. This is certainly a significant outbreak, and in its current state, from what I understand, uh, on a provincial scale, um, the North Shore here is one of the higher intensity locations. And the looper is native to BC, but every couple of decades, its numbers explode. Oh, there might be fewer predators, um, fewer parasitoids, or a drop in the virus load um, that naturally is there that keeps the populations in check. When that happens, loopers literally take a bite out of forests. The damage is done during the larva stage in June and July by the caterpillars. And they're going to start feeding on the needles of a range of conifers and other plants and shrubs. So far, just over 2,000 hectares of coastal forest has been decimated. The looper moth is the most destructive defoliator in the province, but it's not unique to BC. Over the years, it's destroyed millions of hectares of forest across the country. And while it prefers mature hemlocks, it will munch on cedar and fir as well. The outbreak has hit Metro Vancouver watersheds, the Sunshine Coast and the interior. The province is mapping its severity and impact. In the past, BC has managed to weather looper outbreaks, but rising global temperatures could be a complicating factor. If the moths are doing better as a consequence of a warming environment and killing more trees, then of course the forest is not prepared to replace itself as quickly if more trees than normal are killed. 
And so we could have a delay in recovery um, if indeed there is an impact of climate change. Moss, of course, don't just stay in the forest. Neighborhoods are full of them. Where the residential areas uh, meet an interface with the forest, you're going to see the same type of activity that we're seeing right here in the forest. So a lot of moths being present in the residential areas as well as some tree mortality. Expect the moths to fly around until at least the end of the month. Belle Puri, CBC News, North Vancouver. Okay, I'm far from forest where we live and there are moths everywhere right now and taking out the garbage at night is a very precarious thing. You got to turn all the lights off. Yeah. Make sure you try and not get moths in the well, house. They're, no, they're everywhere. I mean, we, we are in North Van and we mm -hmm. do a daily hike into the forest. This morning there were thousands and thousands of them in the forest. A lot of them just attached to the trees. It's oh man. Yes, they're everywhere. Yeah. Just uh, a quick reminder before we go, you can watch this newscast live online every day at 6. And you can find us on CBC Gem, Facebook and YouTube if you want to watch us on TV during the NHL Conference Finals. We'll be on at 7.30, of course, unless the game goes late. Dan Burrett has your late local news on CBC Television 11 right after the National. And we'll leave you tonight with uh, some photos of kids heading back to school. Enjoy.